Hello. For those of you that aren't over here, um, I'm going to give a presentation on the building of the wing ribs for the Spirit of St. Louis. My name is Gordon. Uh, I've worked here in the Air and Space Museum for the last 34 years. Before that, I was a helicopter rescue swimmer. Uh, I came here to do volunteer work in 1981. And I've been working here ever since. Uh, the presentation I'm going to give today is on the Spirit of St. Louis wing rib jig. Uh, the wing rib is one of the most essential part of an aircraft. Every aircraft you see around you, even the helicopter, has ribs inside of the wings. The ribs are the essential structure that gives support to the aircraft itself. A wing rib like this may look simple, it may look light. This wooden rib can support over 700 pounds by itself. We used to set two of these up with a piece of plywood over them and let people jump up and down on them to show them that they don't give at all. Uh, these wing ribs are made out of spruce, exactly like the originals. The jig I'm standing in front of was actually built in 1927 to build the Spirit of St. Louis that Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic. It's a simple piece of wood. It has cutouts in it for all the pieces. You assemble them all very much like a, an erector set. The jig makes sure that every one you make, whether it's the first one or the 600th, all match. You can take these and put them into an aircraft today, and they'll fly exactly as good or as poorly as the ones that were originally made back in 27. We use aircraft spruce. We go up to Los Angeles. There's a place called Aircraft Spruce. It's a great name for a company. Uh, we get exactly the same quality of lumber that the Ryan Company used here in 1927 to build their aircraft. The other parts uh, are these gussets. Each one of these gussets are made out of plywood. It's a, a combination of mahogany and spruce. We cut them out by hand to exactly match the originals. So once we have those parts, we push the, uh, we push the uh, longerons into the holes. We use steam to give them a little bit of a bend, and the rest of it is all a flex. When you put them in here, there's a lot of flex to them. If you pop one end out, it'll come up and whack you in the face. So once we have them in, we start following the template. And for a template, we have an actual wing rib of the type used by Ryan. And when I'm usually building a wing rib, I'll take this template from 1927 and I'll put it inside my rack right here. So when I need to count how many uh, nails go in, I don't guess. I use exactly the same that the original builders in 1927 used. There's one thing that I've, I've given up on. The original and all the gentlemen that did this before me all used horsehide glue. That stuff is nasty. It's the worst smell. It's like decomp and brown sugar mixed together. So I used to be able to stand next to the builder for about 15 minutes before I'd have to leave the building. So I gave up on that. Um, a couple weeks after he retired, I very quietly snuck into the basement and got the kind of wood glue that you would use today. It's every bit as strong. It doesn't have any of the odor. You can pour this on your head and the smell won't bother you. That other stuff is the worst smell I've ever had. Other than that, everything is exactly like the original, to the point that when I use nails, these are 1927 brass nails. I'm about to run out. If any of you have 1927 brass nails, it would really come in handy. Uh, this small amount right here in my hand, usually, well at this point when I run out, I'm going to have to buy them from dollhouse manufacturers. It's the only other people on the planet that use them. Unfortunately, they're bright and shiny. They may as well have made in China on the side because you can tell they're, they're totally modern. Uh, I'd rather not do that, but as you can see, I'm, I'm getting really close. I have enough to make about three more ribs before I have to switch over to those dollhouse nails. Uh, I, I need to tell you a little bit about how I came into this. In 1927, the man that built the wing for the Spirit of St. Louis, he used a NACA airfoil. NACA was the precursor to NASA. They're the people who did all of the research on what wing shapes worked best, what fuselage worked best. So the guy that was assigned uh, at Ryan, right down the hill here, to build these wings. Uh, he used their design, he used all these materials, and he built this particular jig. Frank Burgess was his name. 
And Frank Burgess uh, came into a little bit of a, of a, almost a religious calling late in life. There's a lot of talk about stolen valor where people claim to do something that they, they didn't. Back in the 30s and 40s, if you built aircraft, pretty much everybody knew somebody who claimed that they had helped build the Spirit of St. Louis. So what Frank did is he assembled the actual list of everybody that worked on it, and he'd go around California, and if you were making up a story, he'd bust you publicly. So, so Frank was a little bit of a mercurial guy. Uh, he came to us the first time in 1965 with an offer to build a Spirit of St. Louis flying replica for us. He built a magnificent replica, used all the same uh, materials, everything exactly like the original. He even used several of the builders that helped him on the first one. We had that replica from 65 till 78 when our museum burned to the ground. Uh, a couple homeless people needed to keep warm one night, so they set fire to our building. Uh, I assume it kept them warm. It completely destroyed our entire collection. Uh, we ended up with one artifact left. It was a uniform that was out at a dry cleaning shop. So the following day, the people of San Diego got in their cars and wound through the park in this sad procession. And as they got to the, the smoking pile that used to be our museum, we, we found out that each of the people going by were opening up their trunks and setting boxes on the curb. You open it up and it's granddad's flight helmet and so-and-so's clock out of their famous plane. The coolest thing was one guy pulled up with an airplane on the back of a trailer and said, where do you want it? So uh, before I move on from that, the coolest part of that, in our basement, we have these two massive photo albums. Uh, it's, it's real difficult for one person to lift them up. These photo albums are completely filled with envelopes and letters from school kids. All of the elementary schools in San Diego County organized a drive. They didn't want the money from the parents. They just told the kids, if you have a few pennies, put them in the jar. We got checks from every single elementary school in San Diego, and we've kept all the letters and all the envelopes from then till now. It's amazing that a lot of what you see here was paid for by elementary school kids making those first donations back in the very early 80s. So after we burned down and people started showing up with uh, donations, our friend Frank Burgess showed up. He came out of retirement, he wasn't working at all, he was an uh, 80 year old man by then, but he helped us build two more replicas. If you go to the uh, San Diego airport, I still call it Lindbergh Field, if you go to Lindbergh Field, you'll see that they have a gorgeous reproduction down there that was built here in our basement. The other one is right out in front of this uh, room. Uh, those are the two replicas that Frank Burgess built for us. One of them, ours out front, flew as late as 2000. It's a completely flyable aircraft. If we wanted to, we could push it out the front door, put gas in it, take off and crash right into all those cars that are in the parking lot. It actually would fly if there was enough room to take off. So Frank by then was very advanced in age and it didn't look like he was gonna be with us too much longer. So he brought the jig in with him and he brought in all of the tools, every hammer that he used on the original, the little miniature saws, everything that he used to build the Spirit of St. Louis, he brought to us. He taught uh, three other people how to use this jig. Uh, two have passed away. The third one is my old friend Chuck Doan, the guy in the red right here, uh, shaking Lindbergh's hand. And Chuck Doan, for 22 years, stood at this bench Monday through Friday, he, he usually tried to come in at least two or three days, and he'd stand over behind the Lindbergh uh, Spirit of St. Louis. Nobody ever saw him. Very few people would walk up and talk to him. But Frank would stand there in the shadows and build these wing ribs. I have a book right here, and every time he completed a wing rib, he'd put the serial number and the date. The reason he kept building these was to keep the art alive and to fill a need. The Spirit of St. Louis is an iconic aircraft and a lot of air museums like to have their own. When it comes time to, building, to build a replica, it's pretty difficult to get it exact. Most of the copies you can look at and pretty much tell it's not the original. So there's a lot of people that still build these replicas. And when Frank turned it over to people like Chuck Doan, we produce all of the wing ribs for all of the replicas that you see around the United States. 
Um, the one in the Smithsonian is, is the real one, and you can look at that wing, you can look at our wings, and you can't tell them apart. They're exactly the same. There's a gentleman back east right now that's building his own. He spent his whole life looking up to Lindbergh. He's now in his 80s. He's building his own Spirit of St. Louis that he plans to fly around. That's all he's wanted to do his whole life. So now that he's retired, he's building this airplane. The wing ribs in front of you, the short ones, I'm building these for his project. This morning out front, I finished putting in the last few nails to complete his project. Next week, I'm going to get these covered in turpentine, and I'll ship these to him. And with those, he'll be able to finish his project. It's literally the, the last, uh, last thing he needs to get back into the air. So uh, about six months ago, I noticed that Chuck was really slowing down. He's lost some of his family. He's lost both hips, both knees. And every day, he would stand there on his walker and lean against the bench and do what he could to keep building. But we all knew he wasn't going to keep doing it for very much longer. I am absolutely, if you look around, everybody you see here is a better woodworker than I am. I am the worst. All of the people here can attest to that. But I'm a placeholder. My job is to keep using this jig and to keep building these ribs until we get that perfect volunteer that comes through the front door and says, I want to be a part of this museum. I want to be a part of history. I want to keep this alive. So until that happens, um, I'm going to be standing out front in the dark, leaning against this jig. And this is my tribute to the four guys that learned how to use this before me. Uh, that's pretty much my explanation. I was going to stand up here and bend some nails for you, but uh, I, I can't really show you anything from, from that side, how this would look. Um, if, if you have any questions or uh, when we're done, if you want to come up here and, and actually get a closer view, that would work. Uh, any questions? Sir? It is. Uh, he asked if the airfoil section is the same all the way across. Uh, the, the NACA airfoil design that, that they used at Ryan maintains the same cord. It's a constant cord all the way across. There's no dihedral. That tells you what era it's from, 1927. Dihedral makes a plane far safer and far more controllable. On the flight across the Atlantic, he fell asleep. Uh, Lindbergh fell asleep and ended up doing circles. That's extremely dangerous in a plane that doesn't have dihedral because when you uh, crank the wings over a little bit, it doesn't do a circle, it does a dive. So it's not a plane you would ever want to fall asleep in, that's for sure. Other aircraft, in fact, almost everything you see today, there's some dihedral. What that does is it makes the plane look for a center. If you push the controls and let go, it's gonna go back and try to find a center. So that's the big difference between the Spirit of St. Louis and all the planes that you're probably more familiar with. Any other questions? Any woodworkers? Anybody I can pass this job to? OK. Well, I appreciate you guys for coming. And uh, anytime you come by the museum, you can see the wing rib set up. Uh, we're usually directly behind the Spirit of St. Louis. OK. Thank you guys for coming.